So it would seem like it would be good to be king, although my nephew James might add, or is it? Consider this. John gives us Jesus at his physical and emotional worst. Arrested, disheveled, harassed, hungry, abandoned, sleep deprived, and standing before the notoriously cruel Pontius Pilate for questioning. Hardly a sweeping endorsement of what it means to be king. And Pilate repeatedly asks Jesus, are you a king? Annoyed, perhaps, that this bedraggled peasant is taking up his valuable time on a tense and busy Passover weekend. You say that I'm a king, Jesus answers cryptically, implying that Pilate's question is the wrong one, that Pilate's assumptions about power and kingship are irrelevant to the ways of God. Then Jesus continues, For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate's response is the verse just beyond today's reading, and it's a question to end all questions, so what is the truth? The whole of himself standing beaten and abused before Pilate, Jesus' silence implies his answer. You're looking at it. You're looking at truth. I am the truth, he says, meaning truth isn't some instrument or weapon or some slogan you put on the back of your car. The truth is Jesus, the life of Jesus, the way of Jesus, the love of Jesus. And if Jesus is truth, then truth is king of a kingdom, not of this world. John wants us to see that Jesus' kingdom is not about an earthly rule over and above others. Jesus' kingdom is about relationships. Jesus' kingdom is from God, just as Jesus is from God, and Jesus is God's kingdom. One that the kingdom of, uh, kingdoms of this world cannot or will not see. Revelation 5, verse 10 tells us, You have chosen us to serve our God and formed us into a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth. Remember that from the opening readings? Meaning that we, you and I, have the nature of both a king and a priest embedded within us, in Christ. And since we've been made to be kings and queens of God's kingdom, it's our calling to be king of that something that's not of this world. To bring about thy kingdom come, those words we pray for. The promise of God's kingdom coming, and to be that because it's not here yet. In our waiting, our earthly kingship begs us to be present and doing to recalibrate our imagining of kingship from what the world would have us see to Jesus' truth. Remember, Jesus answered Pilate, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews, fighting to keep him. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here, meaning their reaction is going to be different. All too often our imaginations are dominated by our experience, our stories, our growing up, and all too often our experience of kingdoms is based on a language of power, of influence, of action built on violence and fear rather than love. But Jesus is not of this world. Jesus has come to witness to the truth, and the truth is that God is love. Those earthly authorities, like armies and law enforcement, have a critical role to play in creating more orderly and more just world. There's no argument about that. But as followers of a very different kind of king, we need also to witness that there are limits to their reach and the outcome of force. Because what we focus on expands. So if we focus on fighting instead of loving, that's where our thoughts in our kingdom lands. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We know this. This is our truth. The 
kingdom that Jesus calls us to, this kingdom of loving first and foremost and always, can we emulate that? Day by day, minute by minute? Can we make the leap from earthly to heavenly and do that now? There's some tension around that. And there's a Cherokee story that offers what that might look like, these opposing views, this tension that we hold between earthly and heavenly. The story goes like this. An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger and envy and regret, greed and arrogance and self-pity, guilt and resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority and ego. He continued, the other wolf is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. Here's the thing. The same fight that's going on in me is going on inside of you and inside every other person, too. The grandson thought about it for a minute, and then he asked his grandfather, so which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. That's in the realm of story, and it talks a bit, speaks a bit to kingdoms and ways of living and being. To bring it a little bit more present, another story, written by a man named Andy Stanley. I don't know who he is, but the words speak to where we are right now, I think. Sometimes they just want it to stop. Talk of COVID and looting and brutality and violence. I lose my way and become convinced that this new normal is real life. Then I meet an 87-year-old who talks of living through polio and diphtheria, Vietnam protests, and yet this man is still enchanted with life. He seemed surprised when I said that 2020 must have been especially challenging for him. No, he said slowly, looking me straight in the eyes. I learned a long time ago not to see the world through printed headlines, so I see the world through the people who surround me and make my own headlines, realizing that we love big. So my headlines go something like this, said the old man. Husband loved wife, loves wife today. Family drops everything to come to grandma's bedside. And he patted my hand and said, old man makes new friends. His words collide with my worries and free them from the tether I've been holding so tightly. The worries float away and I'm left with a renewed spirit and a new way to write my own headlines. True, isn't it? Flip it over just a little bit and we can find ourselves closer to the kingdom God of this world than the one we're in. Twice in today's readings from Revelation, statements concluded with the pronouncement of amen, meaning so be it. So may it be that we live into the freedom that Christ provides us to love and serve our neighbors. So may it be that despite the current divisions that constantly flow through our news and media feeds, we embody light. So may it be that Jesus Christ is King and Lord of our lives rather than the things of this world. For we have a God and King whose primary characteristic and value is love. We have a King who created humankind in God's image and called us very good. We have a King who knows our pain, walked in our shoes, and showed us how to really love and be a part of God's kingdom here on earth, even when it feels impossibly difficult and unpopular. We have a king who walks with us now and promises to one day wipe away every tear, make all things new, and
and restore and redeem all of creation. We have a king who taught us what it means to be king, to live as a people who embrace the stranger, the refugee, and the homeless, those who have no help, those who are lost, those that include ourselves. We live as a people who hope in the life of this world and the one to come. This world, God's creation, given to us for our joy and benefit, and in the next that we are challenged to bring closer into this one with our hearts and minds and strength. If we circle back to the Gospel reading, these closing thoughts from The Empire Strikes Out by Steve Garnis Holmes can wrap this together for us. Remember these words. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. But for this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth, which is love. So Pilate thinks and operates in a world of power, the ability to coerce, to get what you want through force or fear, but... Jesus knows that's an imagined world. He lives in the real world of God's love. He bears witness to that love. He embodies it unmistakably, and he is its proof. His being has authority, and his love reigns over the world. But in this world of appearances, what kind of power is that, really? Is Jesus a king or not? Of course he is. He has a greater power than Pilate, and Pilate unconsciously knows it or he wouldn't feel so threatened. Well, Pilate will show Jesus power. The empire will strike Jesus down with the one power the empire has, and that's the power to destroy, the power of fear. And the empire will lose. Rome will impose death, for that's all that Rome can do. But God will give life, for that is what God does. And life will win out over death. Caesar will exercise power and Jesus will exercise love and in the end Jesus will change the world and Caesar will get a salad named after him. <laughs> the empire always loses, exploiting people as pawns in one's power drama rather than meeting them in love as they are always fails. Dominion is illusory. Love overpowers power. It is stronger than fear or death, and in the empire's imaginary world, power and security and status and wearing costumes and pretending to have authority and to give life, pretend that love is powerless. But don't be fooled by the weapons and the costumes in the real world. This world, love is the only power. Resurrection, not death, is always the last word. Love, not death reigns supreme. This is what it means to say that Christ is Lord. God's love and flesh reigns supreme throughout the universe and lives on in us. Is it good to be king?